from scattering of white particles, of photons. And uh, Klaus and I finally figured out who was supposed to talk and who was supposed to share. So Klaus is speaking. And if you look at the current top lines in the program, it was a little. We were a little unsure. Very I, 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 I was called Barry. Blame me. That so was Klaus Klaus Barkshaw, the deep line R matrix methods for electron and photon collisions with Adam Sinaya. Usual rule, 20 minutes. And no questions. No questions. OK, well, thanks very much. And thanks to the organizers uh, for inviting me to give the talk and letting me know as early as last Thursday. <laughs> so, um, well, you have had a chance to look at my uh, overview and where we come from, so I'm not going to talk very much about that, especially in light of the time. Also, you will see some of my slides have things kind of faded out, and so just don't worry about reading all these details. I changed my title a little bit by putting this thing in parentheses because I felt that I should also talk a little bit about the Belfast version of the R matrix method, not just about the one that Oleg Zazzarini uh, developed. And then I have some remarks at the end that hopefully will address some items of this workshop. So I thought before we start about talking about R matrix, we should acknowledge the father of the Belfast R matrix method, or the R matrix method in atomic collisions, really, Phil Burke, uh, who taught me everything I know about this. And uh, basically, I came to Belfast in the early 80s for the first time as a PhD student. And that was certainly not an easy time in Belfast, but uh, some colleague told me, at least for physics, don't worry about it because Phil knows everything. And I found that was kind of true. And the other one I should mention here is Oleg Zazzarini, who has been in my group now since 15 years. And uh, this arm B spine arm matrix method is really his baby. So, uh, just a quick motivation. So, this is the stuff that is sort of uh, faded out. We need a lot of atomic data. And at the end of the day, it's easy to say that in a group of theorists, but I would also be willing to say that when experimentalists are around. At the end of the day, if you want complete data sets for these collisional radiated models, theory is basically the only game in town. So you have to have some theory that can get you the data that you want. Now, there are many ways to get this. And again, I'm only going to talk about this one, the time-dependent close coupling method, which we kind of have seen already. Uh, in its full beauty, it's easily written like this. There's other terms, I'll come back to that. At the end of the day, the thing is, this is easy to write, but it's an infinite sum over the discrete states and an integral over the continuum states, and nobody really knows how to solve these equations as they stand, so this expansion has to be cut off, and this is really the idea of convergent close coupling. Igor will talk about that. R matrix with pseudo states, intermediate energy R matrix, and, so, and some other. The other thing that is kind of important for technical issues, as I will uh, come back to a little bit, is the fact that usually people use mutually orthogonal one electron orbitals to construct all these states that you have. And it turns out that this V-spline R matrix method uh, is addressing some of the issues that come with that. It's, it is convenient, but it is also a somewhat limiting factor in some cases. So again, how do we include the target in a continuum? Well, again, there are other methods, but the one that we do and that the convergent close coupling do is, is basically you add square integrable pseudo states to the close coupling expansion. The next thing is we talked a bit about at lunch. What do you do if you think that relativistic effects could be important? Well, for light systems, you just perform a non relativistic calculation and recouple the results into a, uh, into a relativistic scheme that can be problematic near threshold but generally works quite well for light systems. The next possibility is you use a perturbative bright Pauli type approach, meaning you have non relativistic wave functions but you calculate uh, rather than read in matrix elements of the bright Pauli Hamiltonian and then of course uh, if you want to do it really properly you would use the Dirac based approach. So again, here is the beautiful equation, uh, one more time written down. Uh, so at least the good thing is it's based on the Schrodinger equation in the non-relativistic form. There are relativistic versions. Uh, you do what you have to do. At the end, it looks like this. 
Then you have these coupling potentials, you have exchange terms. Everything is great to write down, not so easy to solve. But again, what I want to point out here is that closed coupling can at least give you complete data sets. And what is very important for um, many applications in plasma physics, they are at least internally consistent because it's a unitary theory that conserves the total flux. And for plasma modelers, that is not unimportant. So if you are wrong, at least you are consistently wrong, and that can help. Um, yeah, this is, sounds like a joke, but it's true. <laughs> so uh, I borrowed a couple of slides from Brendan McLaughlin, and I modified them a little bit. Essentially, the R matrix method, if you want to know all about it, you can read this book uh, written by Phil Burke. This is sort of, I guess, his final masterpiece in, in this area, about 800 pages. And at the end of the day, the R matrix method, in our sense, is nothing else than one method to solve the cross coupling equation. There are many others. Ego will tell us about a different one. Uh, this one is accurate and it's efficient for many energy, and originally it was developed for low energies and resonances. So there is this internal region and the external region, the famous radius A. Don't worry about the details. But it is a method to solve the cross coupling. So the R matrix with pseudo states, well, I had something to do with that. That was probably the first calculation that was really pushed uh, to convergence. Uh, and the idea is basically, again, you probably see a transparency from Igor like this. You have experimental you know, an energy spectrum, which has an infinite number of bound states, and, con uh, and then a continuous continuum. And we represent the high-lying Rydberg states and this continuum with pseudo states and kind of hope for the best uh, that it converges to the correct answer. So uh, that's essentially what it is. Uh, I should also point out that as a byproduct, um, the method allows to calculate ionization processes, and I will show you a couple of examples of that. So this is the Belfast version, just to give you a feeling. So it's a multi-stage. These are not short codes. They have all these states. You calculate radial integrals. Uh, angular integrals, you recouple, you calculate the dialyzer Hamiltonian, and then so on, and you can calculate a whole bunch of things, and they also uh, have this uh, for um, the apparel version. And the, as well, for they have a non they have a similar relativistic bright Pauli, relativistic dark Dirac R matrix atomic cones. So, just to give you a feeling, this is how it looks like. And they actually make a serious attempt to further develop, here it is, not everybody is allowed to do that, which is probably a good idea. Uh, and the other ones, you can kind of download them. In this case, I think you need the password. If you go to Nigel Bagnall's website, you can get it directly. But at least, so these codes are downloadable and, in principle, ready to use. And free. And free. That's right. So what can our matrix do? Just to give you a feeling, this was 20 years ago uh, when I did this calculation using this RMPS method. This is for electron helium scattering. The, uh, my CCC friends, uh, Igor Bray and uh, Dima Force, have a little bit earlier in this case. But at the end, what you see here is very good agreement for excitation of uh, helium, as I said, 20 years ago. But already then, this is quite important, uh, in fact, these data get reassessed uh, you know, on, a, on a permanent basis for Inter International Atomic Energy Agency, for example. And basically, Fritz de Heer in those days already said, look, the best one, if you want to have an uncertainty of about 10% or better, you should just take the average of the theoretical predictions, not the experiment, because it is very, very difficult to get the absolute value of some of these cross-sections, the absolute experimental uncertainty below 30%. And that hasn't really changed much for systems like this. Now, so it looks great, but then you do something else. For example, the metastable excitation function in Krypton. And if I hadn't been a co-author of these two disastrous calculations, I wouldn't show them. <laughs> <laughs> but we tried very hard, and it didn't work. So what is the problem? It turns out neutron targets are tough to start with. And things like Krypton are which in the excited state has an open uh, P-shell, is really different. 
So just remember this. I will show you this transparency again a, a little bit later. So what's the answer? Well, the answer was this is Oleg Zatsarini's baby. As I said, the B spline R matrix method. We have seen a few B splines already in Fernando's talk today. They are having. They have nice numerical properties, but also they are non-orthogonal. Fernando didn't say much about it, but for us, we actually do more than that now. It is not just a numerical basis that we let not to be orthogonal, but we just say, okay, if the energy, if the orbitals are term dependent, we let them use, we, we can use term dependent orbitals. So, say if we do electron collisions with, uh, say, beryllium, we could use two different 2p orbitals to describe the singlet in the triplet state. So, Oleg published this version in 2006. It has a lot of advantages. The problem, as in all the R matrix methods, is that at the end, the, the, the time consuming factor really is the diagonalization of the Hamiltonian matrix. And uh, the record that we know that we, now, that we have now is 400,000, and we need to do that for every partial wave symmetry. And depending on what computer it is these days, but roughly a calculation like that in NSF. Uh, terminology of budgeting costs roughly $50,000. So it's not cheap, we need supercomputers. Um, okay, so now a couple of slides that Oleg showed in, uh, in a workshop right here um, a couple of years ago, also a little bit updated. And so once again, uh, what is the point here? He acknowledges that there are other people around who can do things like that. But this point is important. This, the principal ingredient is the single set of orthogonal one electron orbitals in these methods. And that causes problems when you want to do a very accurate target description for complex systems. Now, this problem goes away a little bit if you do very, very large scale calculations because the variation principle and diagonalization of the states will help you out. The other thing is that there could be pseudo-resonances, uh, and that too, I should say, is not as serious as it maybe used to be some years ago, because uh, there was a, uh, <coughs> a paper by uh, um, Nigel Bednell and Tom Gorsica who kind of showed what to do to fix this. Um, anyway, Alec has this. And the important point here is that this uh, calculation indeed uses non-orthogonal orbital sets, not just in the basis, but also for the actual functions that we use for the, uh, for the, um, the physics. And so we can independently generate the target states using essentially what you would call natural orbitals. And so it includes the term dependence, relaxation effect, correlation effect, and so on. And again, the pseudo-resonance problem is virtually gone. So, uh, again, here's a bit of a history about this. These slides are all available, uh, I guess, and if the talk is taped, you can read in it at the end. I'll talk a little bit about this one. This was not in Oleg's talk yet. And this is sort of the Hall of Fame of the BSR calculation. So if you are a yellow atom, then you were worth being treated by this method. And uh, the Belfast codes, of course, would even be um, much more extensive than this. And we're not talking just about the atom. This is also many of the ions uh, of these atoms. So again, give you a bit of a feeling. Uh, what can this code do? It can do photon processes. I'm not going to talk about that. It can do electron processes on simple and not so simple atoms. It can do also structure calculations, Rydberg series. It can calculate oscillator strength and so on. So this is simply using a collision code like a structure code. That is uh, actually quite efficient. You just change the boundary of condition a little bit, and that's it. So um, the, uh, we wrote a topical review about that, and, but since then, there's a lot of papers have been published uh, because a lot of people need these data. Um, so here is the structure of that code, again, sort of similar to uh, what uh, uh, I mentioned before. So these are multi-step uh, codes. The total number of lines is something like thirty to fifty thousand uh, dollars lines. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, lines fifty thousand dollars per line? Yeah, that's it. No, the total lines. So uh, anyway, so 
Uh, and then, of course, in this case, we use uh, scalar pack. We've tried other ones, but this is basically, as I mentioned, the limiting step here really is this uh, baby over here, this VSRHD, which needs to um, solve the generalized eigenvalue problem inside the R matrix box, and that means it requires the ionization of a matrix. So, um, again, I just want to show you that this is what it can do. And here is the example. You might remember this slide. This is what Oleg got out of it already quite a few years ago. And the main point really was not an additional number of pseudostates. This is relatively low energy. But it turns out that the target description was just hopeless. We could not get a good enough target to describe all these resonances that Steve Buckman had managed in, in, measured in 1983 already. So, uh, just to give you some other examples, some very, very, uh, you know, detailed benchmark experiments by, uh, this was done by uh, Michael Allen. Uh, this is angle differential, so 135 degrees. Michael was very proud of being able to do this 180 degrees, which requires certain tricks in the experiment that I'm not going to talk about. But you see, overall, it's looking very good. So the experiment actually is so detailed that this is a line, right? And this is the calculation. Uh, then there's a lot of other things that is important, but you see here now we get to the coupling to the continuum that I'm sure Igor will talk about. And that shows you that even relatively simple system like neon uh, do not uh, behave properly. So helium is not... Helium is definitely not, uh, neon is not helium, uh, and so if you don't enclose enough states in your calculation, your results at intermediate energies are complete rubbish. Um, and in fact, I should give credit to Connor Balance and Don Griffin, who pointed this out on one point, but it didn't have enough computational power in 2004 to prove that all these results would be rubbish. So we have shown this now in, for many cases, the data that we generate are now in LXCAP and many other databases. So, uh, and uh, really, this was an important point about we now can assign uncertainties uh, to theoretical predictions. There was a FISVET A editorial in 2011. In fact, there was this workshop that I just mentioned already, 2014. There was a follow-up workshop in 2016 that theorists now should point out something about, say something about their accuracy. And so we can now do systematic convergence check. Quick thing, I, say, I mentioned, if you do R matrix and pseudo states, you can do ionization. I don't want to go into the details, just to show it looks pretty good. So these are up initial calculations. Interestingly enough, for a long time, these were believed to be the experimental data, and then it turned out it was those. Uh, single differential cross-section, Triple differential cross sections. We are the only one who can do that. Here's, for example, a calculation that James Corbin was involved. Time dependent close coupling, convergent close coupling can do that. These time design matrix can do that for helium. But if you go to argon, the game is over, basically. Right? As far as I know, BSR is the only method that can calculate properly electron impact on argon. Uh, so this is, was measured in Heidelberg. These are sort of 3D pictures of the cross-section. They can do this reaction microscope wow. beautifully. And that's probably because, again, because of the need to describe the states, right? Uh, the yeah, states, right? that's right. Target states will help. Um, and in fact, this was one of those where it, it didn't agree for a while. And then we did a convergence study, and we told the experimentalists something is wrong with your experiment with the way you process the data, and sure enough, they found a simple error. But at the end, you can see this is sort of the experimental 3D picture, and this is BSR. It's not perfect, but no other theory, at least none that I know of, gets anywhere near the experiment. So he also has uh, started quite a while ago already the, 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 the direct version of this. Again, I don't have a time to go into the details. There turn out to be some technical problems uh, that he and uh, Charles Rose Fischer solved um, about what order of lines you should use. So it's, these are technical issues. Again, is it important? Well, it's, I leave it up to you. So this is Dirac based compared to Bright Pauli. And you see here, if you include 31 states, 
then, well, the DRI is better. If you include more state, it even kind of gets better. So um, if you want to have this kind of accuracy, but the experiment really is, is impressive, right? And that experiment was done in 1983. So uh, I just want to point out here, for example, total cross-sections are often needed. And the important point here is that these are for the noble gases, all the heavy noble gases other than helium. We could go up to 300 EV, which is not normally where we can go to. But it turns out it's a single theory that can do it for all the energies you want. You know, runs our minimum, you name it, everything is there. Uh, just want to talk a little bit about challenging. Well, iron, right? So it turns out that these are very, very expensive calculations. But of course, the astrophysicists love them, right? Um, nobody has done this calculation yet with 716 states. Um, we're working on it. But we need more time from HC. Well, you can help us. Uh, and then we have uh, this is just sort of an example of why, why is this important. But it is important. Uh, so uh, if you did this calculation and you wouldn't include a lot of energies, a lot of stress and stuff, it would end up down here, and all these resonances would be hope would would be ignored and not good. Yeah? So there's still an issue with convergence. Uh, we can start by it. I want to just show you very quickly that VSR can also be used for, say, more exciting topics, which is good for uh, uh, things like if you just don't generate data. So this, for example, was a paper Johannes Feist was uh, still doing atomic physics in those days. Uh, and so basically here the method closed the loophole uh, because now we could say it's not simple electron dipole matrix on the set this. Then we have, that means how long? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> no, no that's, that's, that's impossible. So we, I, have to, I want to say a little bit about this. Uh, but I can do it two minutes. Um, the question here is really in terms of, I don't know exactly what, what, what robust means, but are, they, are these codes sustainable? And the point is that these codes are not easy to use uh, without training, and if you make them freely available, the question is, you know, who will be blamed if somebody uses them and comes up with rubbish? Now, this is not a joke, because I saw it when I was a PhD student, somebody had mixed up the number of electrons in the nuclear charge, and if you try to calculate uh, um, beryllium-like iron, or iron-like beryllium, <laughs> then it's a very different result will come out of that. Um, and, and you have to see it, right? Further development is definitely necessary. Just bigger computer won't do it. So iron and the three most important elements, according to some people at ITER, for example, as is tungsten, tungsten, and tungsten. Um, and uh, it seems to be limited at this moment to a few experts. So without sufficient funding, in my opinion, the codes will ultimately reach the end of the development and ultimately become uh, unusable. And so we responded to the NSF solicitation that just came out for the BSR code development as well as the outreach and training. So please wish us luck and even better if you review it, uh, give it an excellent and write some nice words about it. So with that, I thank you for your attention.